home for eight years. So that was when I figured, you know, I can do a lot in Los Angeles, and I can, you know, travel to Europe and all these other things, but maybe the focus for part of my effort, and I hope part of yours, is to remember these children everywhere else. So Mark had given us a little aspect of what the type one world is like, maybe about 500,000 children, and at least a quarter of them, if not more, every day in a tenuous situation with their supplies. And of course, you know this is not equal across the different geographies. Type one is mainly a Europoid disease more than it is of other ethnic racial groups, which makes it even harder when you go to Sub-Saharan Africa. But what I'm gonna talk about my experience for the last six years going back and forth to Haiti is that they don't expect the children there to actually have type 1 diabetes and had very little to offer unless we come and help, not do the work, but teach them how to do it themselves. And um, that's really what's going on. So there's a lot of organizations. I'm going to start with Life for a Child. So Life for a Child was started by um, an amazing individual in Australia, an endocrinologist, Graham Holdo who realized that the neighbors, these islands all around Australia, had children who had no way to get supplies, had no health care providers who could give them what they need to live with type 1 diabetes. So he started looking at a program, a very comprehensive program, that has now uh, encompassed almost 18,000 children, where they get supplies, many of the supplies they get are from Insulin for Life. They find them a care provider. Often through the International Diabetes Organization called ISPAD, a pediatric endocrinologist, we will find those care providers and help train them. We'll send endocrinologists to Sub-Saharan Africa and other places to train them, and we'll keep them connected, we'll get data and we'll assure that not only are we keeping them alive, but we're continuing to advance their care as well. So here's what these children look like. They're all over those dots on the globe. About 17, 18,000 children totally dependent on this organization, which is nested inside the International, International Diabetes Federation. I don't know if any of you are aware of that. The ADA and AADE are our members from America to the IDF, mainly diabetes associations. It's kind of a, you know, group, a group loosely held together of endocrinologists and interested individuals who are affected by diabetes, and in there is this program that is critical now for these children around the globe. Insulin for Life that, uh, again, started in Australia, so I think there's some kind of theme that these Australian endocrinologists get the importance before the rest of us and actually take action. But Insulin for Life was started by an individual with diabetes who realized he was dispensing, throwing away, getting rid of <coughs> supplies that could be moved to some place where they could be used. So Mark and his wife, Carol, who actually run this program, and they are the core nucleus of everything that happens, now have a U.S. chapter. It's a 501c3, so you could donate or get involved and get your tax write-off as well and send them your supplies. And Mark showed you these pictures, but you can take a child, particularly in India or anywhere, barely alive, at the time of diagnosis and enable them to survive. And this is a typical kind of thing of I have seven children, five are girls, now one is defective and I can't take care of her, no one will marry her, she's a burden and therefore we have to enable them to get the supplies that take that burden off of them financially and allow that child to live. So there's another program inside the IDF that um, my husband and I have been very involved with, which is to take some of these children in these countries around the world and start to train them. 
to be advocates in their own country, to have the ability to go in front of their health ministers or their government or their local control area or how a lot of these countries are divided up by hospital systems and advocate for people with diabetes. So we've been doing this for quite a while. We, at the International Diabetes Federation meetings, we now bring about 100, 150 of these youth from around the world. Um, some are from the United States and Europe, and we mentor, we attach them with somebody from the developing world, and they run camps and educational programs and help connect into some role of advocacy. The president we elected for this group uh, when we were in uh, Australia was a young woman from Pakistan who said when she was diagnosed, her doctor actually told her mother to let her die, that she was not going to um, have a very valued life, wasn't going to be able to get married. That woman is now an engineer. Um, she has two children. She has an amazing, uh, of course, her mother was a physician who did not buy into that concept to let her child die because of the diagnosis of diabetes. And now this young woman meets with the health minister in Pakistan and has helped convince him to move the metric forward for people with type 1 diabetes. Here's what they look like. They're amazing. Um, if I could just get them to uh, go to sleep when we have these meetings. Um, <laughs> Focus on some things that come with a lot of baggage. Actually, last year one of them came, had acute malaria. I never even seen that. Um, and uh, a, a lot of a lot of issues. We do a lot of psychological counseling with these children and help. Um, I think enable them to become become leaders. Here they they are in Australia. Now it's ID up. They're the stars. They get to take the stage. They wrap themselves in their country flag. We paint flags on their faces. They give speeches. Here's our American girl. And um, they truly make a difference. I want to tell you about one other organization that, um, uh, boy, this was how I got into this one was just total serendipity. But um, it's called Ayuda. Ayudar is to help in Spanish. It was started by two high school kids from DC who's one of them had a nanny, and that nanny had a grandson in Ecuador, and he got diabetes, and there was no way he was going to survive. And this kid, when he was 17, <coughs> said, that's not fair. I'm going to do something about it. That young man, Nick Cutchers, is now a pediatric endocrinologist himself, and has been running a camp. And many American college kids, and even last year of high school kids, have gone down to be counselors in this camp. It was first in Ecuador. After many years, it enabled the Ecuadorans to run this camp themselves, so they moved on to a uh, place once in Mexico, once in Peru, and now they've kind of settled in the Dominican Republic. Um, they make a big difference and uh, an opportunity to, again, turn these children into advocates. So the program in Ecuador was so successful. The Diabetes Association of Ecuador took it over and is now able to run it themselves. So lots of opportunities, and if you've got somebody who wants to learn a little bit more Spanish in the Dominican Republic, they actually live with the family for a few days before they run the camp, and uh, these kids run the camp entirely themselves. Here's a picture of the camp um, in Africa. So now I'm going to focus a little bit on my, my work in Haiti. So after the earthquake, um, which obviously devastated uh, Haiti, one of my colleagues, a woman I had worked with for decades, who happened to be Haitian and also a certified diabetes educator, said to me, you know, I'm going to go down to Haiti. Would you come with? They've got a big emerging problem with diabetes. And um, I said, uh, like I usually do, yes way too quickly, um, and then my husband said yes, my husband's a pediatrician as well, and, and we went down there. Um, I, I, this is kind of some of the pictures, let me walk you through some of these. So after the earthquake um, that left uh, 300,000 people dead, another 300,000 people injured, and a million people homeless, 
Um, it was, and, and Mark and his wife had been going down to Haiti for years as well. It was an unbelievable scene. Um, you know, the, uh, it, it was hard to meet a Haitian who didn't lose someone, who didn't lose everything, um, including the upper echelon of people in Haiti who were the doctors and the politicians. The entire presidential palace collapsed. So um, there were tents everywhere, influxes of people trying to rebuild Haiti. And I think it's then when um, most of us realized that I, I can't come and solve Haiti's problems. They're so, so deep that I don't understand. I don't understand how to practice medicine in Haiti. But I can come down, and what we felt we could do the most was we started to run a camp for children. And in that camp, we could bring the healthcare providers and train them while we were in camp. And then after camp, we started a national diabetes education program that we now do every year that educates pediatricians, internists, family practice, nurses, and most importantly, health care workers, community health care workers that go door to door and help screen for people with diabetes. Um, the medical system is very fragmented in Haiti. Haiti is still, I would say, even though it's gotten a little bit better, it is fundamentally a failed political state right now. Just if you want to feel a little bit better about our elections. <laughs> <laughs> they have 54 people running for president. Um, and, and, and likely, not very many are qualified. So um, here, here's, so we hooked up with the Haitian Diabetes Association, which is called FATIMAC, and run by a woman, Nancy Larco, and her husband, Philippe, who's an epidemiologist, Nancy's an endocrinologist, and Nancy's father is 87 years of age and was the first endocrinologist in Haiti. Um, he is amazing. This is the clinic they started. They uh, see patients for free, and they take care of and administer the Life for a Child program. So they register the 103 children in Haiti who are on that program, being able to be survive through that program, and they get the donations from Insulin for, for Life from Mark and his wife. So here's people with type 2 diabetes lining up for free care. They receive supplies. Supplies are limited, so they have to come back every month to get those supplies. You can't give them a big, big hunk of supplies all at once. Um, here's a medical school. It completely collapsed in the earthquake, and I was teaching down there. We go down and we also teach at the medical school for tents in a while. The good news is it has been rebuilt. Here's a, a girl we found in a coma from diabetes on the ward, and there was not a BG meter anywhere. They were managing her in diabetic ketoacidosis with um, urine tests. So we worked hard, and now um, through a lot of different mechanisms, we're seeing we, to, we have been able to get at least BG meters in the hospital, because the lab turnaround for glucose value was 24 hours. Here's a pediatric ward. Um, that's the medicine cabinet. It's left open. Um, still so busy, they still have cholera. Now they have dengue, they have something called chicken gunja, and they also are now getting Zika. So I don't, I, I, we're going down next week, I'm a, um, I, I dip myself in DEET <laughs> multiple times a day. Um, not that I'm gonna get pregnant, but uh, <laughs> here's the, uh, the pediatric ward, and you can find children with diabetes in there. The mothers sleep under the cribs. Here's a pediatric waiting room, uh, the first intake area. Here they're waiting to be seen for whatever illness they may have. And here's our first camp. So we had our first camp. We had it in a uh, church. We had about 37 children that came. We all slept on the floor. Uh, do I look like I'd like to sleep on the floor to anybody? <laughs> the children were amazing. So our favorite game at camp, and it doesn't change year in, year out, is musical chairs. <laughs> it's a tough one. Um, 
the children, many of them don't grow well. I don't know if you can appreciate some of these bellies are bigger than you'd expect. Their livers are a little bit bigger, but they love to dance, they love to do whatever. And you know what the most amazing thing is when you serve them food, and you know, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a vegetarian, I don't eat anything unless I can totally identify what it is, so I don't eat much when I go to Haiti. Um, they beg for more protein. They want another chicken leg or another actually organ part of an animal. They just want protein because that's what they can't get. At home. So we've, we've worked hard with their people. I don't know what they need. I have to go and find out how can I help you. I think if any of us think we can go someplace like Haiti or Sub-Saharan Africa and solve their problems, we are fundamentally crazy. We've got a, them to tell us what their problems are and work through their system to be able to figure out how you can help them. So we set up goals every year. We work in between when we're not there, um, you know, whether we could get some confirmed diabetes rates. That was a big issue because we can't go to the health minister and say it's a big problem if we don't have numbers. So what we did is we trained the older kids from our camp to be community health workers and to go around Haiti and figure out with finger sticks who might have this glycemia and could potentially be diagnosed as having diabetes. One of their big concerns is the feet. Um, so we have, it took us about three, four years, but we finally this last year opened our first foot clinic. Here's one of the rural clinics. So we tried to, through FATIMAC, through Nancy Larco, reach out to other clinics that are run kind of helter skelter. There's very little national oversight. Here's one of them in a, one of the rural areas near the epicenter of where the earthquake was. Um, here's a woman that's the supply that can be given out. And um, uh, here's a, a, a woman who uh, had a pregnancy with a little bit of gestational diabetes. There's the baby. And now the big move to move people out of the tents and into these homes that are prefab, no floor, no running water, no electricity, but better than living in tents. And again, always looking to figure out how can we get more people, children registered for Insulin for Life? How can we take that first camp and make it a better second camp? And uh, kind of on and on, we have meetings with the health minister when we're there. Um, he's still in the tent. Um, and last time we were there, there were chickens running around. Um, I'm nothing against chickens, but they seem to have kind of free reign. Um, and, and whether we can, you know, continue to change mortality rates. Here's our another one of our camps. One of my patients in Los Angeles heard about it, decided she wanted to do a fundraiser for her Sweet Sixteen and not ask anybody for presents, and when she got the money, oh, I think, is that my phone? <laughs> is it coming? Yeah. Really? Uh, just ignore it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that um, she would send it, so that sign is a, is a uh, thank you to my patient who donated money so we could have another camp, and uh, we just keep going on. Here's that. General Ward, the pediatric ward in the General Hospital in Port-au-Prince, where I also teach when I'm down there, that's medical records. They just kind of come stacked up like that. Um, uh, I don't think we could even think about a computer program. And now I want to tell you how we actually treat most of these children. They get pre-mixed 70-30 insulin. That's about the best we can do. I thought we could change things, you know, I would come down, advance stuff, and, you know, teach basal bolus therapy. Well, that didn't work. We taught some of the kids, some of the older kids are on basal bolus therapy, which means they have to carry their insulin with them, which means they have to figure out what they're eating and when, and it was just too hard. So the best we can do is that, for the most part, and a bottle of regular to do some corrections if they need it in between. Here's our youth leaders. So we got these two, and they came to the IDF leadership training that we just had in Vancouver. And uh, matter of fact, they were one of them was elected to be the North American representative of all these kids from all over the world, how much leadership these two actually really have. 
So um, they still face lots of things. They've got cholera, malnutrition. Um, we go to a lot of hospitals. I, I've never seen cholera. I've kind of counted on never seeing cholera. It's uh, the most impressive thing I've ever seen. Um, and you can imagine with all that goes on that diabetes is hard for them to focus on. And uh, um, therefore, we've got to work within their system with their people. So here's here's our camp from last year. We, um, it, you know, they they they're so cute. They come all dressed up, and um, they're they're polite when they ask you a question. They stand in medical school and they want to ask say something. They stand up, um, and um, it's pretty impressive. Here's what it still looks like. Much improved, but all the commerce is on the streets. Um, here's our kids. Um, this is Bruce. They still have stiff joints. Bruce was one of the first. They can't, you know, their hands are stiff. This is giving insulin. Um, and here's now, we actually, this last camp, we decided to have the parents come as well. And we did a lot of education with the parents and support them. So just, uh, here's our foot clinic. So we're really excited about that. And again, all of the things we keep trying to accomplish. Um, many of them, we're not there yet. We may never get there, um, but uh, we keep trying to make, make a big difference. So I'm just gonna tell you one other experience in Kazakhstan. Don't ever mention Borat if you're there. <laughs> <laughs> so Kazakhstan is this huge, amazing country that was Soviet. And now, um, of course, it's independent, although they're a little scared they may get invaded one day. All these old Russian buildings, they look like you're in the land of Oz over here. You can see this building. Here's their national monument. Here's um, uh, another national monument. And this is the president. So they've had the same president since the Soviet time. He's democratically elected every year for life. Um, <laughs> and, and, and this is his little presidential palace that he built for himself. It honestly looks better than Versailles. Uh, but he, and you know, these are uh, global economy changes, but for a while they have a lot of natural resources, a lot of oil, and they had um, the opportunity to leap forward. And their health minister wanted to improve the care, particularly for children with type 1 diabetes. So she approached us, and here's the kids with type 1 diabetes <coughs> there, um, with the craziest idea ever. She approached Medtronic and, um, and actually, actually had an open RFA a request for uh, application, saying, we want to advance the care of children in Kazakhstan. We think we've got about um, a thousand of them, and we're looking for a company that will partner with us and put half of the children in Kazakhstan on insulin pump therapy in one year. Um, so we got there and there were no nurse educators. Uh, I sat in a room with a lot of pediatricians and said, who's an endocrinologist? And um, one hand went up and then I said, who's ever dealt with a child with diabetes? And more hands went up and then the health minister said, okay, now you're all endocrinologists too. <laughs> so, uh, so we, Medtronic contributed um, massive courses to advance nursing care and pediatric endocrine concepts so that we could have an infrastructure and we did end up putting half of the children on insulin pump therapy. I want you to know for our devices, Kazakhstan has the highest penetration rate <laughs> of our 530G system. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it is amazing uh, to see what a country can do. We've done lots of research, lots of projects. Um, we're doing something very similar now in a small province in China where we're advancing insulin pump therapy. And, um, uh, you know, the conclusion of all this is uh, we've made so many advances. And, you know, our, our stream forward should be strong enough to bring the rest of the world with us. Maybe not an absolute parity, but something better than what they've got now, at least in not dying, even before the diagnosis is made. And I think the bottom line, the IDF mantra, the mantra of these children that we train, 
and everybody, I think, who is somehow affected by diabetes should be that no child should die because they don't have insulin and supplies or an educated provider or access to at least some modicum of care to keep them alive and hopefully keep them healthy. So there's lots to do if you're interested, life for a child, insulin for life, um, and uh, you know, for your next with Sweet 16, your bat mitzvah party, whatever it is, as a fundraiser for children with diabetes. Thank you very much.